So part of our development has been to put together a series of programs that touch our audience, teen students, across the broad spectrum of what they want to do and how they see themselves in the future. So the STEM learning equation. I get a whole lot of people saying, you know, you're not a professional educator, you don't know what you're talking about, and you can't prove it. So we've been working with an academic advisory board, and these are, you know, they're, they're, they're fairly credentialed. They're MIT Media Lab, the Georgia Tech Research Institute, uh, Dr. Um, Giselle Bennett there, uh, Dr. Pam Northrup at University of West Florida. We've got Purdue, we have Notre Dame, that have all started to say, maybe this guy isn't as stupid as he looks, and there might be some of this stuff that makes sense. So we've been working for the last year to prove it using a lot of the, the data that we have from industries that are outside of education. So we start with the STEM education. This is the primary STEM education that we have in the United States. I heard a lot of great things about this community and what you're doing. I'll tell you right now, the United States, we're in bad shape in this subject, inspiring, engaging kids in STEM. Our numbers are not good. They're not growing. They're not getting better. If I go to individual education communities, every one of them are the best in the world. I come from the 11th biggest school district in the United States, Orange County. You go in front of the superintendent and the board, we are doing great work. 23% of our kids from five schools go to high school. 45% of our people graduate from high school. So we're not doing that well. Now, I'm not calling about college. I'm talking about high school. So we have to look very critically at what we're doing. The STEM education right now is an integral of, of, a, of a curve of information that we want our students to learn. O is a discrete learning objective. T is testing or validation that they know that objective, and we build on those. It's a relatively fixed curve, what we call pacing. So we have pacing across. It can be an algebra pacing class. It can be a science pacing class. But this is the pacing we use from an education standpoint across the weeks that they're in school. That's the education equation that generally is used, and again, primarily in the science technology, the hard sciences that I've heard today. The STEM learning equation that we feel is appropriate, it's a derivative equation. It actually looks toward the function of inspiration and engagement of a student over time. One of the interesting things that, uh, at uh, Warrington Middle School, you'll see a, a, film, a little piece on in just a minute. They said, well, what do you want to measure? You think you're so smart. And I said, well, two things I want to measure to know whether these kids are learning. I want to measure their absenteeism, and I want to uh, measure the behavior. And I said, what the, you know, leave again. So you're not measuring their education. I said, if these kids show up, they're not absent, and they're engaged in class, if they're not learning something, that's our fault, not their fault. So let's measure those two things. At Warrington Middle School, which you'll see in just a minute, this is a 95% free and reduced lunch program. There are about 15% of those kids that will graduate from high school, statistically. It's an inner city middle school in a medium-sized city in the United States. We measured absenteeism and behavior. And they went to five. We, we hoped to have 25 kids sign up for this class. 125 did. Over the school year, we had five student absent days of 125 kids. Five days. They have five a week in most of the classes. We had two reported behavior problems. The reported behavior problems where the teacher has to take a student and move them to the principal's office because the behavior is out of control within the classroom. Two. They usually have two a day. They had two in the year. So the students were inspired and engaged. What happened? They had a 40% improvement on FCAT in math and science. FCAT being the Florida Comprehensive Achievement Test. And everybody said, well, okay, well, that was an accident. <laughs> Prove it again. So we say it's the STEM learning equation. Now everybody says, okay, well, graph it. Well, I'm an engineer. I like this stuff. You get my you know, TI-83 out and blah, 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 blah. I'm graphing. So, the STEM education equation is a pacing curve. It's got a bunch of discrete objectives. You're adding them up, and the knowledge you're trying to deliver is the area under the curve. It's a bunch of stuff we've defined. You can go to curriculum. We've got McGraw-Hill, Pearson, a bunch of people. This is the way it's done. We think it's the learning equation. We think the body of knowledge to be learned, defined by relevant achievable student goals, the distance, drive through the variables of inspiration and engagement. What we're saying is that, that students learn differently. Every one of them do. I did. 
And so the learning that's taking place is the first and second derivative. It's the velocity of what you're putting in place. And it's the acceleration. That acceleration is important because we get to watch kids learn and watch that slope change. The slope changes we think are plateaus. And there are different plateau experiences that we, you have. In, in, um, in, in math, some of them in the middle school level are coordinate systems. Coordinate systems are a problem. It wouldn't be a problem for an, an audience like you or, of course, our students in the back. But if I go to most adults and I said, look, I need you to convert from a Cartesian coordinate system to a polar coordinate system, you know, eyes roll back in their head, uh, polar, polar what? Um, you know, come on. So if I said, okay, well, hey, you've got a target that's 20 miles west and 20 miles north. Give me a bearing to hit it. Ah, we've just created the same thing. Now, most of you immediately knew that's going to be a 45-degree angle because the legs of the triangle are the same, right? Okay, that's knowledge that all of you own. You, didn't, you don't memorize that. You know it. Also, if I said 20 miles west and 20 miles south, and you said 45 degrees, you'd know you're in the wrong quadrant. So all that kind of stuff becomes an owned knowledge that, unfortunately, for most students, we find is a plateau piece. And if they don't get it in two weeks under our current education program, they failed at math, you need to consider taking up music. The last thing you want to do is design a theme park ride. Okay? So we, we, if you fail in those little things up there, we start to say you're a failure. You got a 70 on a test. I write games. The last thing I want to do is produce a game where everybody gets 100. You know what? I can't sell it. Because if they consistently get 100, they won't play the game. Where you play is when you're consistently pushed, when, you're consi when you play in an 80 to 105 percent. But that's not the way we test. We, we want everybody to make 100. If everybody's making 100 all the time, you're not pushing anybody. The, get, the goal is to understand where we are in those curves. What's the red line? The red line's the inspiration. You start, anybody starts learning in an inspiration curve because engagement is hard. Engagement, I think it was uh, Ward saying, yeah, you, you got to get them going. You got to give them a duck for crying out loud. Every, you know, I saw some duck building like crazy an hour ago. So you were inspired and engaged. Now all we have to do is make sure we understand the plateaus. You need more proof than that. Well, let me show you. This is the Warrington Middle School classroom. This is their classroom. something that no schools really have so far and this is something new and something everyone should experience. It helps me learn how to do math that I didn't know how to do before I started this class. It's not just a video game that people play around with, it's teaching you about math and science and everything. This is the top, this is what you look for every day, pretty much coming in here. You don't even realize you're learning half the time. I mean, you're just fine. This simulator will train you like on the simulator. You actually have to use the math to see how, when you'll turn and how many minutes it's gonna take before your turn and what cruising speed you'll have to use and what they communicate with. Some people would call it a game, but when you get on this, it is totally different. That is the actual Warrington classroom. Those classrooms exist now throughout the U.S. Um, the, these do not replace core 
educational programs. They don't replace algebra class, they're the lab classes. When we grew up, we had junior high, and we had a lot of lab classes, labs built around industries or expectations you ha might have for a career. Could be shop class, could be auto body class, could be whatever it was. But it was recognized that it, when you become a teenager, you want to be engaged in the things in the future. You want your aspirations and your inspirations to match where you think you're going. So these are integrating labs that apply the knowledge gained through the, particular, the traditional science and math courses in skills that, the, that interest the students. What we found is that the teachers of the core courses end up feeding back the in information back to the development studios and back to like Dr. Preston Obrey at UWF or Dr. Bennett at Georgia Tech so that we can constantly improve the game engines that drive the underlying learning objectives that are tested when the students play the game. 